Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's great to see all of you gathered here in our Lord's house offering worship and praise for all the many blessings he continually showers upon us. A couple of brief announcements before we begin. Um, today, uh, this afternoon, or well, this morning, 10 to 1, I believe it is, Lutheran High Northeast is having their um, pancake feed. Um, so if you want to go to that, it's free will offering. Um, 22nd of this month, two Sundays from now, um, we're having voters meeting after church. The main thing will be the election of officers, so put that on your calendar as well. And then also on the 22nd, um, Sunday the 22nd of this month, Christ Lutheran School is having the ribbon cutting for the grand opening of their addition onto their school at 2 p.m. in the afternoon if you'd like to partake in that. And with that, we follow our order of services printed out for us and our bulletin is also up on the overhead. We begin with our opening hymn, Christ is Our Cornerstone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. The stone that the builders rejected. This is the Lord's doing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We join in singing our Kyrie and Gloria.
Let us pray together. Almighty God, your Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption. Grant us courage to take up our cross daily and follow him wherever he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. That's also going to be the text for our message today. Let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked to, for it to yield grapes, why did it not? Why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for today comes from the book of Philippians chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ, in, of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We stand and speak our Alleluia and verse together. Alleluia is not my word like fire, declares the Lord. What has straw in common with wheat? Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of the house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent, another ser sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and kill him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, 
He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits of their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in singing our creedal hymn. Please be seated as we join in singing, O love how deep, how broad, how high.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our message today comes from our Old Testament reading of Isaiah 5. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern. Dear friends in Christ, please be seated. They say that winemaking is pretty easy. A winemaker, or vintner as they're known, can use flowers such as marigolds or carnations. They can use vegetables such as carrots or potatoes. They can use grains such as wheat or barley. Or they can use fruits such as grapes, cherries, and many other types of fruits to, to make wine and produce a good quality wine. As long as the fruit flies and the airspace are eliminated, a fermented product can be tasted within a week or tucked away for a year or more. Vine making then, or growing the grapes on the other hand, is quite hard, it's very difficult. The grower is concerned not only with making the wine, but with making vines which make grapes that can be made into wine. Starting a vineyard is not only expensive, but it's very um, time consuming and very laborious. It takes lots and lots of work. Everything is done with great care and love. The selection of a piece of ground then is the first important step for a vineyard. Vineyards on Israel's topography were commonly planted on the side of a hill, on a hillside or on the hillside uh, side of a mountain out there. Israel was very fertile land, but it was rugged land. The stones had to be removed from the land they chose, along with the other vegetations, along with the weeds and the thorns before digging and hoeing and terracing and preparing the soil for the vines. Good drainage was a must. Grapevines were then selected. They often would gra graft other vines together in order to get optimum wines and the best grapes for great wines, both for taste and hardy plants that they needed and to be sturdy and durable in that terrain. And the vineyard needs protection. Protection then from the wild animals out there and the rodents and rats, the wild boars, the foxes, the, the birds and the insects. And the domesticated intruders were there also, such as sheep and goats or the common thief. Oftentimes a wall of stone was built around the vineyard or a hedge of thorns were put up, were used in order to keep all of that out. Even a watchtower was oftentimes built in the middle of the vineyard field. If a person is to be a vintner, he will have to spend a lot of time, energy, and money from the very beginning of the process to the very end. You've also got to have the vat, the wine press, wine skins, hired workers to work in the vineyard and to harvest the grapes. Isaiah sings the song of the vintner, the well-beloved, it says in the text, the beloved and his vineyard. From our text it says, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it too and then waited for the harvest. The well-beloved has a vineyard. He chooses wisely the piece of ground to have this vineyard. The winemaker had chosen the land and told his very first steward, Abram, to your offspring, he says in Genesis 12, I will give you this land. Those tenants of Abraham's seed came along many years later. They filled the land. As we hear in Psalm 80, tells us and gives testimony to this. He says, I brought you a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and you planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. I sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. When the tenants were about to establish the vineyard of the Lord, God, the landlord himself, gave them a great, huge sign. It was a massive cluster, a single cluster of grapes so large that it had to be carried on a pole by two men. And we're told of that in Numbers 13. The land was a gift to them from God. The owner of the vineyard, he had a purpose. It was to establish Jerusalem so that the promised inheritor of the, of the vineyard could, could come there and gather the fruits. Jerusalem is the vineyard. The temple is built there on the highest hill, a fertile hill. 
Father Jacob's prophecy to his son Judah rings out from Genesis 49. It says, Judah, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of the grapes. The gospel is so rich here in what's taking place. If Isaiah were preaching to us today, he would say what he says in our text. In Isaiah 55, he would say, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, he tells us. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What do Jacob, Isaac, and Judah have to offer us? Well, they have to offer us Just one thing, Jesus. Jesus coming. Jesus as the vine. Jesus proceeding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Jesus as his life is crushed out on the rock of Calvary. Jesus as his blood drips from him and the cross down onto the rocks like the juice of the grapes being stomped in the wine press and and into the wine vat below. The Lord says in Isaiah 63, he says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. There's no one who does good. Not one person who does any good. And in our text he says, he looked for his vineyard to yield grapes, but it yielded only wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? The expectation for this vineyard from the vintner himself was to produce good juice turning into fine wine. But then comes a very grating note, an off-key note, if you will, in this song. We find out and we hear the grapes are sour and the juice is undrinkable. The prophet asks his hearers to judge between the farmer and his vineyard, between the groom and his bride, the lover and the beloved. Just who is at fault here? What has happened? God's chosen nation, Israel, was a bad tenant. Israel allowed the weeds of false doctrine to grow among its branches. She permitted the wild boars of the false teachers to eat the good grapes and root out the noble vine of God's planting. And when the, the, the landowner, Lord, sent his servants, the prophets collected the fruit, the vine dressers of Israel, and they beat them and and killed and stoned the prophets that came. The owner, undeterred because he loves his vineyard, will even at the last resort send his one and only son, his well-beloved son. Surely the tenants will respect and love his son and give them back to, give the share back to the Lord, but not so. We hear from our text, he too was killed. Make no mistake about it, God is not mocked. Our Lord does not take hatred of his well-beloved lightly. The Lord holds those who hate him in contempt. He speaks to them in his wrath, as our text say, says. It says, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will make it a waste. God will not let evil go unpunished. There are no such thing, that, there are such things as the grapes of wrath here where God will trample out a vintage, right? He tramples his fury, his people in fury, our text says. He takes away the hedge surrounding it, protecting the vineyard. The Lord breaks down the wall of stone, if you will, and he stops the rain also. This is not pretend wrath or anger on our Lord's part. It is real, it is devastating. He hates rebellion against his word. This is not the sin of one group of people in ancient times and in ancient places. It's for all of us because our scriptures tell us for all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each lamb has turned to his own way thinking that his way is right and good and it will be pleasing to God. The problem then and now does not lie with God but it lies with us. 
The Israelites should have responded to God's grace and mercy with praise and thanksgiving to God and live lives of love to God and to others. God expected good grapes from his people, but instead he saw wild grapes. The wild grapes of selfishness, of corruption, of greed, of wickedness. God's will is done in heaven and on earth. And the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated by the Assyrians and then taken into bondage. The ten tribes were lost and they were never ever heard from again. Judah was defeated by Babylon and taken into exile. The land was despoiled. The temple was destroyed. The mighty were brought low. What God spoke through the prophet Isaiah came to pass. God lifted his protecting hand and the land of Israel was completely laid waste. They were no more. Yet there is both life and death in the vineyard. Branches are pruned. That which does not bear fruit is cut away with and burned. After the first Lord's Supper, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, leaves the company of the 12 disciples. He is pruned, if you will. He is cut away. The other 11 will bear much fruit as branches in the vine. And you and I gathered here today, and all Christians are offshoots of those 11 disciples. We're part of those branches, those vines, the fruit of the vine of Jesus, you could say. And we continue to bear fruit because we are made clean in the waters of holy baptism. We stay connected to the vine, Jesus Christ, and to his word and sacraments, and we stay connected to him as one of his children. Our tongues, like Isaiah's tongues, sing the song of our well-beloved then. Our hunger and our thirst for that crimson blood of Jesus shed for our sins, we thirst for it. The righteousness of which we once boasted then, that of our flesh and the law, as Paul would say, we now count as rubbish. Paul says the exact same thing in our, in our epistle lesson. We know Christ Jesus. We know who he is. We are in Christ Jesus and he is in us. We know the power of his resurrection and thus press forward to the, to the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus for all of us. Finally then, through all of this, we are blessed to be the Lord's vineyard. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith. In Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We stand and sing our offertory hymn.
Let us pray. O Lord, you have planted, nurtured, and hedged around your vineyard, the church. You sent your dear son to give his life for her. Inspire her by your Holy Spirit to yield much fruit for your kingdom and grant that many may find shelter on her holy hill. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, since your Son has made us his own by death, grant that we may share in his sufferings with confidence and that we may also know the power of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Shine your light upon us, O Lord, that we may do what is good and right and live as faithful citizens in our nation. Bless our president, our governor, and our mayor, and all those elected and appointed to make, administer, and judge our laws. Lord, in your mercy. Divine vine dresser, you prune those whom you love. Strengthen our hearts to heed your law, that we may never presume to sin nor trust in our own deeds, but look to you and the rainfall of your grace for our source and norm of all of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, bring forth fruit from this barren earth, a holy people to press forward to your heavenly goal. Direct all of our zeal toward your good and gracious purpose and prosper the work of the hands that labor in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father in heaven, ruler over all, we come before you today and we remember the, the earthquake in Afghanistan and the people there and ask that you send your helpers and your brothers and sisters in Christ there to share the good message and to work with them in recovery and as they get over this and the death toll. We also ask, Lord, that you be with all who are involved in the war that is now broken out in the mid Middle East and bring peace quickly if it be your will. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, you sing the, the song of your love over the vineyard of your church. Lift her united voice through your spirit that she in turn would freely praise your lavish grace and proclaim your salvation beyond her walls. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn.
Again, good morning to all of you. It's great to have you here this morning. Those announcements again that I had at the beginning, Lutheran High Northeast has a pancake breakfast going on right now till one o'clock. Uh, the 22nd, a um, couple Sundays from now, our voters meeting held right after church service with the election of officers and also that afternoon, Christ Lutheran Schools ribbon, ribbon, ribbon cutting, whew, ribbon cutting um, for the new addition onto the school. It's a great, fantastic facility. Get some time, you might wanna go over for that and see, take the tours around. As you go about your walk with the Lord this week, remember that you're part of the vineyard. You've been planted in the vineyard through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're connected to the vine, Jesus Christ himself, and he gives you the ability to stay faithful and to grow and produce good fruit for his plan of salvation for all people. Have a great rest of the week with the Lord. I'll see you in the back.